Hey everybody and welcome to another episode, I think it's episode 80 of Design Recharge. I'm super excited to have Diane Domeyer back. She's the executive director at the Creative Group and she's been with Robert Half uh, Corporation for 22 years. I'm going to let her introduce herself um, a little bit deeper and if you didn't get her last um, Design Recharge episode. I'm going to share that link over here so you guys can watch it again because it was really good and it really tells about what the creative group does. So Diane, tell us a little bit about what you do and and what maybe the creative group does. Absolutely. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it and congratulations Diane on the 80th episode. Very exciting. Um, and we see we have people from all over the world on the call, so very exciting. Um, so yes, as Diane said, I'm the executive director for the Creative Group, and uh, the Creative Group throughout North, North America specializes in connecting marketing and creative professionals with hiring managers looking to bring on marketing, creative, interactive, advertising, and PR professionals. So. We service, as we said on our last uh, spreecast, we service markets throughout North America, um, all the top media markets, and uh, with that, we literally work with thousands of hiring managers and job seekers in those professional disciplines, um, you know, to kind of make that match happen. So, um, I have been with Robert Half for 22 years, uh, both from a staffing and recruiting standpoint, um, but also overseeing our strategic marketing. Uh, and advertising programs for the company, uh, and then also, of course, working with job seekers and hiring managers. So very happy to be here. Yes, I'm super excited to have you. And so personal branding is really a hot topic, and I, I want you to kind of define it for some people who maybe don't know, and then we're going to get into what the difference between personal brand is and uh, a company brand. Right, right. So, you know, it's interesting because Diane and I actually, you, we talked about this just even very recently about you think about personal brand and you think about company brand, right? So obviously there's many people listening that are very familiar with the importance of branding, but it's almost an opportunity, especially for designers, that can be almost three-dimensional, right? So you've got the company brand for maybe the work that you're doing. You may have a company brand for your own business. Maybe it's as a freelancer or some of the work that you've specifically done. So think of yourself as a freelancer, as a designer, as your own company. And then you've got your personal brand, right? And so when you think of the personal brand, it includes your visual identity as well as your verbal identity, right? So um, you know, it's the visual identity being um, you know, your logo, your website, your uh, LinkedIn profile, what have you, your verbal identify being, uh, your verbal identity being kind of your messaging, right? So I don't know if I've explained that very clear, but then when you think about kind of a company brand versus a personal brand. So if you think about company from the standpoint of you're representing your own business, your talent, you know, that's one aspect, whereas your personal brand overarches much of that because your personal brand both visually and verbally speaks about who you are the skill set that you have what you want to convey about yourself as a as a creative professional it might identify if you're looking for a job or a career right so your personal brand may have an aspect that that represents how you want to look to a prospective employer and then a personal brand may also be about kind of a broader sense of what is your involvement in your industry. So it's overarching, if you will, whereas a company brand serves the aspect of securing work, representing work, representing the, the, the company that you represent, if that makes sense. Yeah, so and we talked a little bit about this when we talked before, but it was a, with the personal brand, it has to do with kind of everything. It's where you volunteer, it's your professional, it's also, and maybe a little bit of personal, and we're going to get into that. Um, that's one of the later questions, but <coughs> it could be, it, it, but usually that, per, that personal brand is kind of overarching everything, and then the company brand is, is just for that company, and right. hopefully you have, it's, from the top down, everybody has the same message. Right, 
Right, right, exactly. That they're cohesive and they work one and with one another. But as you as you described, if you think of the personal brand, there may be the aspect of the skills that you have, the experience that you've had, the um, you know kind of aspirations that you have, kind of what what is the need that you want to address. It could be your industry involvement. It could be your social involvement. So it's all aspect. All aspects where you've worked, what businesses you're a part of, what businesses you've owned. So it's all aspects of that to meet kind of a variety of, of uh, uh, people that are in your network or that you'd like to have in your network. So when somebody's going and they want to do um, maybe get a job and they're still freelancing but they're looking for a job. I have this question asked a lot. So what should they use? Should they use their company brand um, because they're still also looking for freelance work or should they use their personal brand or does it matter? Well, it, it matters in some degrees, right? Because if, if it's, because oftentimes we know of individuals who are doing freelance work and so they have their company brand for their freelance work, right? Yet at the same time, they may also be thinking if they could land a home somewhere that meets their career aspirations, that utilizes their skills and experience, that they might actually be okay with no longer doing freelance work, right? So right. If, if that was the case, I would say personal brand, right? If, however, they were looking to do some project work, represent themselves exclusively and continue on the freelance, then they might use their freelance company brand, if that makes sense. But you really, do you see a lot of people, and we're going to talk about this, let's just ask this question. So with people's personal brand, is it always their name? Oh, yes. Or Good question. Is, the, is that different? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, you definitely see a little bit of both, right? So um, from a personal brand standpoint, again, if it's, especially if it's kind of career aspirations, et cetera, you always want to make it easy to be found. Right? And so in many cases, it's easier and avoids some brand confusion, if you will, if you use your personal brand. However, you know, it might be Diane Domeyer and any combination of that I can't get. Right? It might not be as available right. to me. So I may use, you know, a different aspect of that, which is my LinkedIn profile link or my email address, but then I may use my freelance brand. Right, so um, uh, you just want to be sure that whichever you use, or in some cases, if you use both, generally they point to one another. Right, you've got to mm -hmm. make it clear that if I'm using my personal brand somewhere on that to avoid brand confusion. I may have my freelance company brand. Right, so and I think that there's also some situations where the development of a personal brand that's not your name may show some creativity may show some indication of the work that you do. But again, if that's what you're using, you've got to make it very, very clear if someone finds you through that angle, how do they get in touch with you directly? Right, definitely. OK, so what you guys go, to the creative group, you write for uh, a ton of publications, major design publications, How Magazine, um, um, Graphic Design, USA, I mean, a ton of publication. Every month I see stuff from y'all. And you go to conferences. You guys speak at conferences. You also do portfolio reviews. So you see hundreds and hundreds of portfolios a year. So what is some of the biggest pitfalls that you see and you have seen that you can kind of warn us against um, yeah. in regards to that personal brand? Yeah, and we really have seen it all, right? Not only based on some of those portfolio reviews and contests that we particularly <coughs> but that we participate in, but annually we literally meet with tens of thousands of individuals, designers in particular, looking for work. So we've seen the best and we've seen those that maybe need a little work, right? So I guess I would fir first answer that by saying, you know, what do our clients tell us, right? So we see them, but what do we hear from our clients, meaning our hiring managers? And 
Uh, we did a survey last year, and 32% of advertising and marketing professionals that we surveyed said that the biggest pitfall that they saw was that um, their portfolios didn't show the value provided to the customer. So that was like the, the most commonly cited mistake, right, which is the work is shown, but it doesn't necessarily demonstrate how did that help that particular organization or agency meet their objectives, right? So as an example, you could always use it anything. I mean, companies are looking for results-driven work, right? So to showcase mm -hmm. the work, but without talking about maybe some of the metrics associated with were you able to increase traffic or time spent on the site or derive direct call to action if it was a web development, as an example, web design. Right. You know, or was there something that you did, maybe if it's not as measurable, where you were able to overcome a tight budget or a tight time frame, or if any of the work had any particular awards associated with it. So I would say, while you know, ideally a designer might think the work should speak for itself, never assume that it does, right? So I would say that's the first mistake. I think it also, it's always that end product, like a designer has, oh, here's the piece, but that's really not the end of the life, of that's just the beginning right. once you give it to the client, and it's about tracking that, and I think some designers haven't, that hasn't been in their vocabulary to go back and check and, and keep up with that, so I think that's really key for us, and I think you could maybe if it is with some measurables you could do some case studies or have at the end of um, you know a, as you're talking show a case studies or a infographic at the end of that part of the portfolio or something yep absolutely. great idea I, I would say the second the second um, kind of commonly um, challenging opportunity that those same hiring managers told us it wasn't quite as many about tw I'm a little bit short of 20 percent said that um, lack of organization was the second most common, right? So again, the work needs to speak for itself. It needs to be results oriented, but it does still need to be laid out in a way that's easy to work with, easy to uncover. In some cases, people include too many samples. Um, our hiring managers have set a, set, told us that on average, they prefer to view about eight items right, to showcase, so you want the variety in the portfolio, but you don't want it to be too broad such that the, you know, kind of your core competencies don't come through and, they're, and or they're not organized. And you can have more, you just don't have to show it every time. If you have 15 pieces in your portfolio, you ho hopefully you're narrowing it down for each person that you're going to and you're targeting your portfolio. And I would think, just like what we're trying to do with our clients and show um, how uh, our designs have worked and helped, I would think that at the same time we're also trying to see how we can differentiate in that company, how hiring us right would make them stronger or we're able to provide something else. And I think that, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case in the 90s when I was getting my first job, but it really is important now to know, you know, what you are going to be able to provide to that company that they don't have yet. Well, so let me give you an example, okay? So, um, Anyone that works with us at the creative group, um, when they come to us and they're a designer, again, whether they're starting out or they've been doing it for some time, we have an opportunity for them to upload their work on a site that we utilize to share with our clients. And oftentimes, the designers that we work with will say, well, I've spent a lot of time you know, putting my URL together. Why would I put it on yours? And so one of the reasons that we tell them that there's an advantage to them to do that is that we can tailor to the needs of the client, right? So because, you know, I there was recently a designer that I was working with who had done some really progressive work for GoDaddy.com in kind of the web design and, and branding side of things, and then had also done some work for Bank of America. So we were considering this individual for another large financial institution and so it made more sense to not show the real progressive edgy, you know, for this other financial institution. Not to say that they weren't, but it, the, the, 
the other financial institution was much more of a match. So it allowed us to kind of showcase rather than here's the full portfolio, which if someone opened the edgy work might have immediately said, I'm not interested in that person. We're a little more conservative as a brand. Um, and so it allowed for that tailor, you know, tailored approach to the needs of the client. Yeah. Well, I, that's a great example. I mean, sometimes you just, I, it, it's not the case anymore where you just go in with the exact same 15 or 12 pieces that you just go and show. You really do. You have to research the company and see what they do. And you may see that they're in a going in a new direction and you might want to put some of those in. And that's when you guys are talking to them, you can kind of see, oh, you know what, they want something edgy and then you could have put the GoDaddy piece in. But if if you're talking to them and they don't want that, then it's right. definitely. And, and or they had an issue with that with someone most recently that it wasn't a match or potentially, you know, if they're, if someone, you know, says to us, well, I'm really looking for someone that has a lot of versatility and a lot of ability to be able to, you know, kind of work with the creative brief and match that using their own style, but yet really meeting the needs, then, then that full portfolio might have been just fine, right? So that tailored approach uh, is very, very important in the portfolio. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm, I always write lots of notes. So that's good. <clears throat> always things I can, I can share with my students. So what have, so we kind of talked about some of the pitfalls. So what have some of the things of these portfolios that have just wowed you in, in, that have made them stand out and then at the end of the day you're like, oh my goodness, did you see so-and-so? What, what was it or you know, has it been? I, all right, I'm going to sound very cliche, Diane, but you know, we talk about creativity, right? And so oftentimes the ones that really just set you back are those that can demonstrate that you're more of a trendsetter versus a trend follower, right? Right. And again, we surveyed our managers last year, and I think it was 69% of the hiring managers said when they review a portfolio, what they value the most is overall creativity, right? So well, what does that mean, right, overall creativity? So, um, <laughs> you know, um, when, when I think about kind of the four main <coughs> functions associated with reviewing a portfolio, it would be number one, is it creative from the standpoint of does it balance form and function, right? So form mm -hmm. that's more, you know, kind of trend setting again versus trend following um, has the creative design, but also the function or the ease of presentation that you understand what it's saying. So that's the creativity. So number one would be creativity. Number two, you know, is it easy to navigate, right? So the portfolio, the portfolio, especially a digital portfolio, in and of itself also is about, you know, there's design in the portfolio, right? It's not just the right. works. It's does it work? Does it demonstrate what the, the, you know, the breadth of activities? And is it easy to navigate? Thirdly, I would say kind of over that, overarching is coming to personal brand. Do you get a sense of who they are, right? The designer, right? Not only what is their skills and expertise and what can they do, but oftentimes you can see in the design and in the portfolio their interests, their passions. You know, you can kind of read through the designer a little bit, and sometimes that just really stands out in the creativity. And then fourthly, of course, would be the technical aspect of do you get a sense of their strengths? Right, so I'll use you know web design as an example. Do, do they have mobile? Can you get a sense for responsive design, multiple platforms, ease of use? Right. So in addition to you know and functional user experience, in addition to <coughs> right. So the breadth right. of that skill in that area. So those would be the four things: is it creative, easy to navigate? Do you get a sense of who that designer is? And can you really kind of look into and does it demonstrate where their strengths are both, you know, technically and visually? So how does the personal brand play a role in the portfolio? Is it, is it just in, um, you know, 
I mean, I think it could be in everything. It's it's the way it's mounted. If you have real boards, it's the way it's put up on the on screen. If you're doing it on screen, it's the other graphics that go with it. That you know, it's that sense of uh, of space as well. You know, how much space are you, is it really cramped on the site or physically? Um, what do you, what do you think with in regards to personal brand, people could do to stand out? with their portfolio? That's a very good question. I mean, I guess I would Sorry. say, well, I mean, it wasn't on the list. It, no, but that's okay. It's partially, you know, does the brand feed into all of that or it, it's almost kind of an overarching thing. When I look at that portfolio, <laughs> can I get a sense, again, when you think about what is the personal brand? What are your skills? What are your experiences? What are your interests? What are your mm -hmm. desires? What is your expertise, right? So all of that goes into defining your personal brand. And so the portfolio feeds into that personal brand, right? And so you've got to look at the portfolio and say, okay, what do, what do I want to convey in my personal brand? And is that demonstrated effectively in my portfolio, right? Um, you know, so... You know, as an example, you might be personal brand. You might do some things for um, social connections or community work on your own, right? That might not necessarily make, you know, be obvious that that should be a part of your portfolio. Yet, if you've had an opportunity to volunteer and do some work for your local organization because that's something you have a passion for, and you've decided to do, you know, uh, an ad publication for them or a promotional flyer, Include it in your portfolio, and it's going to say something about who you are and what you're passionate about. Totally. Good. Good advice, for sure. All right, so let's talk about social media, because that's another aspect that um, when I was getting a job, it wasn't an uh, issue because it didn't exist. Um, <clears throat> back in 96, back then, <laughs> the, it, I we barely had an email address. Again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm okay. <laughs> All right, so um, how does social media play a role in the designer's personal brand? And how important is social media for the personal branding? And what's the best way to dive in to social media, especially maybe for freelancers who have a limited time and a uh, and who can't spend all this time posting things? Yeah, well, you know, I guess I would first answer that by question, that question by referring it to kind of the hiring process, right? So I know we're talking about personal brand overall and not just about seeking jobs, but, you know, we have seen drastic increases in how employers look at social media to evaluate prospective clients, right? And certainly versus you know, back when I was looking for a job early in those days, it wasn't there. Um, but still, um, you know, uh, we did a survey last year and 72% of hiring managers that we talked to said they look you up on social media, right? So if we asked that same question five or six years ago, I don't have the stats, but it would have been strikingly lower, right? So 72% yeah. said they will Google you, your name, they will look at your Facebook profile. They will look at your LinkedIn profile. And if you have a personal brand or an association that you're involved with, they will Google you by name. And oftentimes that's either in the interview process or maybe even beforehand. So social media is absolutely very, very important in establishing your personal brand. So, you know, what can you do to kind of establish that? Um, I think you need to make sure, well, first of all, I've told, I've told people that we've done career counseling for, Google yourself, right? Just find out how you look, right? You know, in, in other words, find out if you're involved in different things, what would an employer potentially see? And then mm -hmm. does that match what is your personal brand? Again, that might be your Facebook page. It might be your Twitter account. It might be your LinkedIn. And there is a um, blurring of the lines a little bit between professional and personal because they're, they're networking sites for both personal and professional reasons. So you just need to make sure that it demonstrates, your brand demonstrates, of course, utmost professionalism. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing is to back up for a second. 
you need to to have a personal brand and to Google and say, does this is this the personal brand that I want to portray online or so with social media? You've got to first define what is your personal brand, right? So, um, you know, I've told people before, you know what your skills are, you know what your experiences are, but you've got to assess your desires, you've got to assess your passions. So. Do your own personal brainstorming, right? Like, what do you want your personal brand to be? Write them all down. Well, and I've used this book from Robin Landa, and it's awesome. And we had her on. And if anybody's looking, because you do, you have to start with you. But that book, Build Your Own Brand, is a great book to start with because it asks you those questions. And there's some prompts in there that kind of start you on of what you're really trying to say because I do think you have to you do have to start there yeah you have to start with define your brand right so what are the what what do you brainstorm come down to your top 10 and then prioritize those to the top two or three that you want to always convey when someone finds you however they find you online and you use social media to convey that so once you've defined your personal brand now when you do the Google test you have to say, litmus test, okay, does my personal brand, those three things that I prioritize to come through with every vehicle, you know, does that mm -hmm. show through, right? So serious, professionally focused, you know, what have you, whatever that, that would be that defines who you are. And then when I Google and I find myself having a cocktail on the beach in Cabo, you know, does, does the brand, you know, say the brand that I want, or fun and edgy, okay, maybe that'll work, right? So um, so you have to define that personal brand and then kind of run the test. So I know you asked a couple questions, but does that answer kind of uh, how you get started with social media? It does, and I'm going to share one little antidote that somebody um, shared with me that on, uh, on another episode. Zachary Smith said, when and he was using Instagram, and he was just using it with it personally, um, and then he was like, you know what, I'm deleting everything because I really want this to be a professional outlet. So he didn't, you know, he, maybe he made it another Instagram account for his personal stuff, but he decided he deleted everything and he started over with just his work um, and he does a lot of hand lettering. And so then his site became kind of a portfolio kind of um, site. But now there is some of that blurring it can be good because it can help you reach um, an audience on a, a personal level instead of just um, so like uh, Costandinos down here he's at Finlo on Instagram and he has two dogs and he has he posts lots of things but he also is a, a hand letterer as well so it's like you know there's so much you can do but if you totally take out all the personal is it as rich? Can you answer that, or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I would say, well, first of all, uh, I would imagine the majority of the folks that are that are that are with us today, you know, being in the creative industry, uh, the creative industry is uh, it, it's okay to be a little bit more blurred, frankly, than you know maybe if I'm an accounting and finance professional, right? Um, <laughs> So, so, um, so, you know, I think there is kind of that uh, importance, especially when you talk about your personal brand should convey, you know, and, and employers, they want to know your skills, your experience, and then will you be a cultural fit? They want to know who you are, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and, and especially in the field of design, your passions come through in your work, right? Or if you're not working on something you're as passionate about, sometimes that's reflected in your work as well. So, so you do need. It is okay to demonstrate who you are as an individual, what your passions are. Um, it's just you always want to overlay that with an element of professionalism, right? So, you know, you've got to think through the lens of the person that's looking looking at your brand. Right? They could be a little more on the conservative side. They could be otherwise. They want to know a little bit about you, but they just don't want to know too much. Right? right. So, but yet at the same time, as it relates to social media, maybe not as related to the brand, your personal brand, but you have to recognize it plays into it. Is you have have personal interactions via social media, right? Mm -hmm. And they're valuable personal interactions. So, if it's something that you really want to be on the personal versus your professional brand, you generally do that in closed groups, right? So. 
where invite only, you know, I've got my Facebook page that is specifically right. what I would say to Facebook and or to my family, but it's not open to everyone else, right? So you're just mindful about that. Um, but I do think it's okay that your personal interests come through. You just need to have an overarching uh, level of professionalism. And I think there's a, if you were doing something that wasn't um, admirable, you know, uh, if he was giving his dogs beer or something, you know, on, that might not be so great. And then like walking them in the yard with traffic or something. This mm -hmm. isn't a good thing. So you have to have, um, I know a teacher in Georgia um, was fired because she had a beer, which she was old enough to drink, but she was in at the uh, Guinness uh, factory or wherever and um, I don't think they call it a factory I don't know why I called it a factory but anyway you know what I mean but you know that was on her Facebook and she had it private so only her friends could see her kids students couldn't see but still she was fired over this just because of professionally that she was a high school teacher or something so they didn't want that um, with it and I think you always have to and I think the the younger generation don't think of it how that's really going to affect them later. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, and I think to that point as well, you know, it's not only um, tailoring to your audience, um, but also, you know, there are certain tools that you may use in social media. Some are more casual than others, right? So right. if you, you, you have the same personal brand needs to come through. So think of them as different mediums, right? So uh, you look at anyone's... Um, you know, kind of professional descriptor, descriptor on Twitter is very different than what you see on a LinkedIn profile, right? And right. so, and then of course, to even a different level, kind of what you see on Facebook, you know, is a little bit different. So there's a little bit of an understanding of the mediums are a little bit different, right? So I somewhat expect when I'm connecting with someone or if I'm going to follow someone on their Twitter page, I get a fun little descriptor of who they are, but yet it might look totally different on LinkedIn. Yet the personal brand comes through in all of that. Um, so let, let's talk. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you also asked previously about what if you don't have a whole lot of time, right, as it relates to social media. Um, I mean, you want what you post and what you have up there to be fresh, but the other piece is think of it in terms of, of, of quality versus <coughs> quantity needs to be current, focus on it being, you know, well described, um, that it fits in with your personal brand. Um, you know, you should use many mediums, right? If you really want to network, you know, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, uh, Twitter, you know, because LinkedIn, they all serve somewhat different purposes. So, you know, if you've got profiles on each of those, just focus on the quality of each of them. Um, and then that it, again, fits in with your personal brand. So how often should you update your personal brands? And what are any suggestions you can give us? If we're in all these places, and should we be everywhere, or should we just pick a few? Okay, so I would say um, how often should you update your brand? Well, first of all, any branding expert would tell you that the brand should constantly be evolving, but yet if you think about any major organization, they don't rebrand very often, right? right? But the brand and the messaging associated with it and the, you know, kind of sub um, messaging and communications is adapting with the times, yet the core message of the brand oftentimes stays the same. So I think so the same goes true for your personal brand. It should be constantly evolving to the extent that there are updates, right? Like we've said, your personal brand may be defined by your skills, your expertise, your desires, your passions, your industry involvement, right? So if I have picked up a six-month engagement somewhere, my brand should be updated because I probably have a skills or experience there that I want to include in my brand. But those top three messages that I wanted my brand to convey are still the same, right? Right. So when you have those major updates, you make those changes. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess as it comes to um, 
uh, you know, the second part of your question, um, you know, do you go deep in multiple play one couple of places? Yeah, I would generally say that the same is true in the old offline world. The more places you network, the more opportunities will be forthcoming. So, and the audiences are different. So you do want to cast a fairly wide net. Um, yet at the same time, I would, you know, to just get your general presence there. But then to really use one or two of them very, very effectively um, is probably, you know, maybe all that you have time for, and that's totally okay. You know? So um, I, for example, have gone much deeper in my LinkedIn involvement, um, more recently on my Twitter. Um, and, you know, both are equally beneficial, but, you know, kind of had to prioritize one versus the other, and then it comes over time. Absolutely. So, and I also think with those deep roots or a wide net, um, when you do make, when you do really plant a seed, you want to make a, a real authentic connection. Would you agree Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. And obviously, obviously you can't be really deep connected to every, everyone, everywhere, but hopefully you, you reach out and you try to comment or, um, you know, just connect with them and say, hey, I'm listening, that was a great quote, or that was a great article, or, you know, if you see something that connects back to them, oh, man, have you seen this person? And then you be that that intermediary connector, I think, is, is an important part of, it, it helps your personal brand as well. Absolutely. And, you know, also thinking back to another part of your question about, you know, going back to the how often should you update it, right? Mm -hmm. um, definitely as you get older, time moves faster, um, <laughs> as I can attest, but so, so some of us need more reminders because a month goes by in a hurry or three months goes by in a hurry, right? So, so it, it's good to take almost like a monthly review, um, you know, minimally every other month, but right, just to schedule with yourself, okay, what's my presence online, you know, via social media, what have I done? Because, you know, all of a sudden before you know it, you know, you were you received some award, or your portfolio was recognized, or you got an you know um, some kind of a merit accomplishment, and you've missed out on three or four months of having that as a part of your brand. Oh, I've got to add that right. to my profile, right? So right. some months you may have nothing to add; others, it's just easier to keep keep on top of it. Right, that's great. So, you know, um, with LinkedIn, they now have you can add images. And I think they have like 25 to 50 that you can add. As a, as a designer, I think this would be a really good addition to, to that. So, with, so that you're staying um, as a trendsetter or that you're um, meeting your customers' needs, things like this, um, how often should you take stuff off? Is it, is it you reassess that just as you get um, awards and things like that? Maybe it's a quarterly kind of assessment or? Yeah, I mean, I would it's... probably say it's kind of, you know, it, it's, it's, it's probably quarterly. But what I would, I guess a couple of best practices is to, of course, much like you would do with your, with your, um, uh, you know, print portfolio or a digital portfolio, you, you do have to make sure that, that if it's work you're doing for others, that you've got permissions and you're protecting confidentiality, right? right. Um, so, and yet, at the, I mean, that's, I know it's a basic point, but yet at the same time, um, you want to make sure that, again, it constantly reinforces your brand, but that you've got new visual aspects that are up there. And so LinkedIn, as you described, has, has a wonderful aspect of, you know, in some cases years ago when I was, you know, as a recruiter, if someone didn't have a resume, I'm like, I, I'm not going to be able to interview you without a resume. You know, today if you show up, you still have to have your resume ready, but someone shows up and there's no resume, I've already looked at their LinkedIn profile, so you have their resume, right? Oftentimes designers include the link to their um, their, you know, company brand or their um, URL that they personally have. And then you can upload work. The other piece right. on LinkedIn that's a part of your brand is endorsements, recommendations, mm -hmm. right? Who's following you, right? That says a lot about kind of who you are, right? So right. the more active you are in the use of social media, 
the more you can establish yourself as an expert, even frankly if you're new in your career. Um, but coming back to your initial picture about visual representation, we definitely are seeing more designers take advantage of that. Um, they will, a small sample, thinking back to that, employers generally want to see eight pieces on average. Um, you can provide a link, if you have one, to a, a more in-depth portfolio mm -hmm. if they want to see more. Think of it as a feature or a teaser, and, you know, it's a great opportunity. Um, for anyone that, you know, may not yet have a digital portfolio, it's, again, it's a perfect opportunity to put some of that work there. Um, but you can also use sites like Coreflot and Behance and others or, you know, TCG's digital portfolio tool to use kind of a, a layout and a format already to help upload some of your work. Cool. And I'm going to share a link that uh, you had shared with me. This is the Business Etiquette Online. So I'm going to put that on the screen. This is something you guys can, um, it's like a white paper. You can download it uh, and, and read it, and maybe it'll help you. And it kind of covers a lot of the stuff with social and that personal brand that we've talked about. It's a really good one. Okay. All right, so um, we do have a question from the audience so from Grundy Designs. I'm going to go ahead and, and read it. I'm going to pull it. Uh, it's really long, so I'm going to read it first, and then I'll pull it online. Um, how are you supposed to know ahead of time what they are looking for to prepare, as you said? I have found the company wants to see your stuff and talk to you before telling you what they want, because you could be making it appear to be what they want based on um, what they want, uh, what they want, not what shows you in your work. Hope that makes sense. I think I, it does. Um, so for me, this is that networking is key uh, right. to knowing some of this. Let, let's hear what you have to say. Well, so um, I think what this individual, you know, may be getting at is, you know, whether you're looking for freelance work or potentially in a job interview. Um, you know, the, the person evaluating your work and whether you're the right fit is being very cautious not to provide leading questions, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can all ask a leading answer a leading question in hopes that we're going to tell them what they want to hear. So <laughs> if they're not giving you any of that information, aside from, as you said, I mean, if you can find out from your network, uh, I guess, first of all, what I would say is before going in, because most hiring managers or most project directors are probably going to use very open-ended questions to see if you've got the qualifications and then go into the specifications once they generally think that you're a fit. So the one thing that you can do is prepare before going in by, of course, doing your research on the company. But another great example is if you go to LinkedIn and you enter the company, you can get a sense of others that work there, right? And, you know, if, if they're in design, like, take a look at some of their work if they have it. Or if they, on their LinkedIn personal profile, they happen to show their portfolio. You might be able to come up with a general sense of either the culture, or the look and the feel, right, the types of individuals that they brought on board. But um, even if you're not able to kind of completely pull all that together, if you go into that situation, the most important thing to do is, is not to second guess what are they really looking for here so I can answer it correctly, but rather be able to demonstrate as you explain your work, what we talked about earlier, be results oriented. What contributions did that work have to helping that project or initiative meet its goals and objectives? Um, so again, be results oriented. Also, be very, very careful to be able to um, communicate not only the work and what skills you needed to do it, but how you worked with the team to deliver that, right? What direction were you given? What was the type of culture that you work in? Um, so uh, much like other job seekers may do that don't have a design background, they've got to think about what are the strengths that they bring to the table over anyone else. And so again, your work, you've got to think about what did I contribute in this work that would have been notable to that potential em employer, and so use it as an accomplishment. So I want to speak to something being results oriented, and I want to speak to them as specific accomplishments that I may have brought to that project over maybe a peer or someone else that might have done that work. 
And I think it's about being curious. I think that that's a great tip to go to the LinkedIn for the company and then kind of do your research on the people that might be interviewing you or might be part of that um, trendsetter, whatever, or the organization's kind of growth and see what they are looking at on Twitter or on other places. And, and really, you have to do some research, which can can help you to know that, hey, you know what, this isn't a good fit for me. This isn't really what I want to do. Or maybe they're looking into doing more blogs and you already have a blog, but they don't know how to do a blog or you have a podcast and they don't. And now you can, you, you don't know if that's what they're going for, but you, this is something that else that you bring to the table. All right. Yeah. So uh, Dwayne says, I find Glassdoor.com, another resource for research on companies and past employees. Cool. I'll definitely check that out. Have you used that, Diane? I know we have. Yeah, we, I mean, that's definitely something that you can find out more information. So, it's, yeah, again, there's, there's many resources aside from the general social media. And so um, that is a great resource to re research other companies. And, you know, I guess one more tip, and I'm not necessarily here to put a plug in for LinkedIn, but... It is kind of ever evolving, right? They're ever evolving in terms of even the information that they provide. And so it's in different places, but you can see if you follow a company, right? You're interested in getting into a company or doing work for a company. You follow that company and set up an alert anytime that there's changes there. And you can see recently hired, like who did they recently hire? Um, and again, you're gonna get more than just you know creative and, and marketing. But you kind of get a sense for what are some of the backgrounds. Um, you can also oftentimes, uh, there's a section on the company too that you can see where oftentimes when they do hire, what sources or other companies do they, um, do they generally pull their people from. So that if I'm interested in ABC company, but there's another company that's just like them, you know what, maybe I broaden my horizons and get some experience, you know, trying to reach out to that company as well. Right. That's, those are awesome. Those are awesome tips. Okay. So here's kind of a, and we talked about this the other day. So how much, what portion of my marketing budget maybe should be dedicated to personal branding and collateral? And th does this maybe change as a person progresses in their career? I would say it probably changes, um, but I would, you know, I would I would say that generally there's a lot that you can do to promote your personal brand that doesn't have a whole lot of cost associated with it. What I find oftentimes in speaking with people is that the biggest cost that people have when they're first starting out may be time, right? Time more so right. than actually quantifiable dollars, right? So you've got to establish your brand, you've got to update your social media, you've got to make sure your portfolio is prepared, you've got to have your resume ready. Right, you've got to have, um, you know, if someone wants information as it relates to, um, you know, just even a leave behind for your, you know, your freelance business, you got to have the business cards and maybe, you know, something that shows your creativity. I know, Diane, yesterday when you and I, or the other day we spoke about it, you mentioned, you know, cheaply you can brand stickers and things like that just to get your name or your business out there. But I de definitely would say that, especially. When individuals are first starting out, take the time. You got to start somewhere, and it is quality over quantity. But there's more. Um, your network may not be established enough yet that it's fully working for you. So it's going mm -hmm. to take a more of an investment of your time um, on the front end than maybe someone who's been doing it for some time. So um, going back to social media. One of that investments is building your network, building your connections, right? Um, I think we could all speak to examples of individuals who may um, tweet or follow us on Twitter or, or what have you, and you just continuously run into their name, and before you know it, you just assume they're an expert, but they may not have 15 years of experience. They're just very right. present. They're building their brand, and before you know it, that brand has been built to be an expert in the field of user experience or what have you, right? Right. Um, so I don't know that I could tell you, you know, what's the budget that you could assign. I think that depends on individuals. So there's a, but there is a lot that you can do with the investment of your time that costs really very little. So 
Laura says, um, this is assuming that you have an alternative revenue source while you're taking the time to do all of this. I, you know what, Laura, I, I really think that this is time-wise, budget-wise, no matter what, I think that you have to make time to, um, just like if you're trying to find a job, maybe you have a job, but you have to you have to take certain days so that you can go have interviews. Well, on those days, on any time you're doing marketing, um, even if you're a freelancer, you have to commit time every week to do marketing. And maybe it's a part of every day, um, you know, whatever. But time, like Alma says, is the currency, currency of productivity. And that was Todd Henry um, from his book, Die Empty. And I, I mean, I, the time thing is huge. I don't know if it ever, I sometimes think the time is more expensive than the uh, the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. But how, do, there you, are, how do you, you know, but in the mobile you, world today, there's a lot that you can do in small snippets, right? Right. And so I know we're all trying to keep our lives balanced and what have you, but you have access to be able to update things in small increments, right? Um, and so, but, you know, you, you do have to kind of take the time. I would also say, you know, as, as it relates to making sure that you've got an income stream, um, you know, there are times, there may be times you have more time available because you're between projects. So really take advantage of that while at the same time, you know, seeking out your next project. But also, you know, utilize a specialized recruiter, right? A specialized recruiter, it's one of the advantages is that you have an opportunity where, they become your talent agent, right? They may not help you with your personal brand or your, you know, your profile or your online presence. Although in some ways right. they can. Our candidates have the benefit if they've got great work, we'll feature it on the on our website, right? Um, so you know you can you can utilize a recruiter to be that talent agent to help you have continuous projects, so that you're also you know not feeling the 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 pinch of if I take the time to you know, spend a little bit of time updating my online presence that I know that I still have someone that's helping me to look for work. Does that make sense? And I, Yeah. I also think a, a great way, Laura, what I would do is maybe take some process shots. This seems to be very um, something that people are kind of really hungry for. I know on Dribbble, on Behance, on Instagram, those tend to be some of the um, most popular posts. Uh, posts. And, you know, they get the most likes or some of the process shots. So maybe you're not done. Maybe it's you're not completed with it because sometimes it takes a while to get all the revisions and everything. But the maybe you could take some process shots of you figuring out colors. Maybe you print a mood board or a color palette or something that will help you. And then that helps people also see how you work, I would think. Something else. Um, so Alma says, what's the trend in the graphics slash marketing field of professionals using a recruiter? Well, so, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm maybe going to make some assumptions, Alma, as to kind of what you mean by that. But, I mean, uh, definitely the use of a recruiter to help, you know, make sure that an opportunity, whether it be a career opportunity or a project that you're interested in, matches what your brand is. In other words, your personal interests and your personal skills is has always been of great value but I think in particular in an environment where unemployment is going down and by the way in the marketing graphics and especially in the interactive space the unemployment rates are significantly lower than the national average which just fell below seven percent so what that does mean is that there's greater demand in some case you know less supply um, and yet, at the same time, if you're a freelancer, you want to, You're still. You still may struggle a little bit with. I've got to have continuous work, but I also you'll have more choices, right? So, so, so that you don't have to take the first opportunity that comes your way. You can work with a recruiter to help you make sure that the opportunity again uses your skills, experience, and desires. Um, I would definitely say, especially in the interactive space, interactive design. Um, that you know more and more um, hiring professionals are coming our way um, because the the unemployment rates there are significantly lower and they're having a hard time finding the talent that's available to help them on a short-term basis 
or maybe they're freelancers that they have relationships with are so busy that they're not available to them. <laughs> you know, and, and so in some cases, they'll they'll we see an increase in that um, demand coming to us for for assistance. So I also think Diane, one of the great things about using a recruiter is that as if you're trying to break into something or you're or you're trying to do something, um, even if it's something you've been doing, sometimes if it's a if they are a new company, sometimes it's hard maybe to get paid or to do you know they're not really worked out. And I know that with TCG, they're actually making sure that they're going to you're going to get paid and. Yeah. And that is, it's the confidence that it's a, it's somebody who's going to be investing even because you do not, TCG is not just for people wanting a full-time job, which they totally do that too, but they also do freelance project by project. Yep. And there's consistency of reliable pay. And then again, you have an agent that is working or a recruiter, we'll say agent though, that's working on your behalf to make sure that you know, in addition to whatever business development you may do to seek out projects, that they are acting on your behalf to find other opportunities as well. And then, then your um, the the personality at work and the personality with the recruiter is going to help you in the future because now you've re established a relationship with that recruiter and now they can be like oh this company needs somebody who has a lot of energy and they are doing whatever so they're really your advocate I, I that's how I I see them You're absolutely um, right. all right so so Alma says could we say then companies are more inclined to rely on companies like yours in order to save time and money to and meet their needs I would say, I mean, that is definitely an opportunity, um, kind of one of the values that we provide to an organization or to a hiring manager because oftentimes they may have an unexpected um, absence or a gap on their team. They may have a situation where um, they thought they had the resources to meet a deadline and the deadline's creeping up. And, and if they don't have their own immediate available access of, of freelancers that they may have previously vetted and interviewed and work with and can endorse, then they save the time by calling us to say, I need someone here tomorrow or Thursday. So, you know, please make sure that you, they have the qualifications. You've checked their references, right? You've got some testimonials based on work they've done elsewhere. So that saves them time by allowing us to access the talent like just in time, right? In terms of saving money, I mean, there can be productivity gains um, as a result of bringing them in. So ultimately, where a, a company may save money by working through us is that they will staff at a core level to maintain their, you know, their, their steady flow of work, their steady flow of projects. And then they have a major initiative like branding or something like that, where they may work with an outside agency. But meanwhile, they're not going to staff up their full-time staff to that level. So we save them money by allowing them to have a flexible staffing option through the use of our services, through the use of freelancers they may have their own connections with, and through the use of an agency to kind of have that right level of resources at the most, you know, kind of cost in the most cost-effective way. Good answer. All right. So I'm going to – this. we have one um, – one more question, I hopefully. Um, well, one quick. We kind of touched on it when you we were talking about like uh, LinkedIn and and putting up some of some work maybe that was um, you had won awards. But how important are these competitions for designers um, in or freelancers in getting their name out there and their personal brand known? How how important is that? Well, I mean, ultimately. You know, especially when you're first starting out, you want to get your name out there any way that you can, right? And, and as long as it, you know, meets your personal goals. So it definitely can help you get your name out, right? Um, and, you know, with that, if you win an award, um, again, going back to the point about employers want to see what contributions you've made, right? If something is award winning or you've been recognized for that, um, clearly, it's a differentiator, right? So there's advantage to that. So number one, it can get your name out there. Number two, you know, it can help to build your cre uh, credibility. But you know, there is a reality that in some cases, some of those competitions charge an entrance fee, right? Some of them don't. You know, like um, you know, I know we're doing something with the Rhode Island School of Design for their students, right? So so there, 
portfolio review and and you know maybe there'll be a recognition so that's enter where you can when it's free if you have the means to be able to participate in that competition um, you know then I would say do it to get your name out there even if you're not recognized yet if you're not at a point where you can afford an entrance fee that's okay as well and you can kind of look for other opportunities to get your work your work recognized so bottom line is I would say they're definitely beneficial um, be mindful of which one you know and again whether you win or you don't it gets you it gets your name out there and then the other thing which I meant to talk about earlier is when you establish your personal brand you want neutral parties to give you feedback right on on your portfolio on your resume on your LinkedIn profile right and so um, you know a portfolio review or a design competition oftentimes again whether whether you're recognized as a winner or not is a great way to get that neutral feedback right so there's a there's definitely an advantage to that all right so the last question I wanted to ask is what kind of brand strategy would you suggest for a designer um, either just just entering the workforce and then is it different for a designer who's kind of trying to change direction so maybe they've been doing print design and now they want to do UX or user experience design is there a different strategy for those types of people getting using their personal brand I mean I would generally say that many of the tips that we've talked about here are beneficial whether you're just getting started or whether you've been doing it for some time right because even as we talk about creating your personal brand right if you're for, if you're just getting started out you may def, you, you need to take the time to define it if you've been in the business for quite some time your brand is going to evolve and so it may be more of an iterative process but there may be major times where you've got to completely rebrand yourself right so as an example my personal brand when I was 24 years old coming out of school and you know what I was looking to do at that time was very different than after I had my children and I had 15 years of experience and so what I was interested in doing and what my brand could tell you about myself while my core values may have been the same would be very different but I would use probably all of the same vehicles I think one of the primary differences for individuals with more experience is chances are they have a more established network so if you rebrand yourself kind of getting that you know uh, out to as many people as possible may take a little less time than someone that's new in their in their career or early in their career but I think the tips cool. are all still the same to be honest I think the strategies are very similar uh, it just may take more of an investment of time uh, when you're first getting started and I think that it, go, it goes back to networking and trying, even with Twitter, with Instagram, with LinkedIn, with Facebook, being present so that people start recognizing your name and not just that you're commenting and agreeing like, great job, but the, you actually have something to add, I think um, will help uh, get get some information out there. I know there's some other links that we want to share that the creative group has created and um, I'm going to plop them up here. I'm going to put them in both the um, oh, point in the wrong way over there and below here. So this is the first one. This is the how to create an online portfolio and then there's one called um, portfolio examples which I think will be very helpful to a lot of people because then that way you're going to be able to see some of the examples that are successful correct yes exactly yep. all right and then there's an, a huge amount of uh, weekly resources that the creative group comes out and they put on their blog and these are quick you can get on their newsletter it will be sent to you but these are are, are really really good for designers um, to keep in the back of their mind even if you're not looking for a job it's that's not only what these these uh, tips and the things that the blog is about isn't only about that at all so it's a really good newsletter to get onto. and I guess and I Do would add to that Diane that I mean uh, as you talk about the blog is it really is about industry trends, workplace trends, 
um, skills and, and techniques that are that we're hearing are in demand from our from our hiring managers. So it's all aspects, right? So it's again, it's not just about the job search, but our goal at the creative group, in addition to making those connections between um, the talent and the hiring uh, professionals, is to be a resource relative to trends in our space and trends in our industry. So you'll see that on the blog. Cool. Well, you guys give back so much, and I so appreciate you guys coming and doing once quarterly um, a design recharge. So I really appreciate it. I always get a ton out of it. Diane, you're excellent to interview. You have tons of information, and you're always happy and pleasant, and you can laugh easily. I always think that's a good <laughs> a good attribute of a guest. So if you don't ever want to miss an episode, then go to designrecharge.org slash subscribe land and subscribe to my newsletter. I just send you two. I send you a reminder 30 minutes before the live interview. And then I also send you the questions the day before so that if you have some questions, I will go ahead and ask them on air. We'll get those on. And then I'm also doing something new, so another newsletter. Um, I used to do it all combined, and um, one of my students was like, oh, my gosh, I'm getting an email from you every day. So I decided to split it up. <laughs> so that was for you, Stephanie. I have split it up. Now you have to um, do for, you have to sign up for the tips. So these are business tips, creativity tips, things that maybe I do in class with my students, and then also things that I've done in my business that have helped me. And that's it. If you want to connect with Diane, which I definitely suggest, obviously she's on LinkedIn. Um, I have her um, Twitter handle, so I'm going to share that. I'm going to put that on screen, which is just her exact name, Diane Domeyer. Um, and then for me, if you want to connect with me on Twitter, you can do it at, at Design Recharge or at Diane Gibbs AU. And then on Facebook, this is how to, or Instagram, this is how to get, um, stay in touch with Design Recharge, me, during the week. So, Diane, thank you so much. It's always nice thank having you. another Diane that spells their name like me. <laughs> the only one, Ed. Thank you for having me, and thanks to everyone for the questions. And uh, just even as Diane put up the Twitter handles and the Facebook sites, I think you saw some good examples of personal brands, professional brands, and company brands, right? So they interplay very well together. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And you guys, I'll see you next week. And have a great one. Bye-bye.